Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Up to now we've, we've been doing linear stuff. So we've been talking about perturbations and when we've had a perturbation we've made it small, right? So that quadratic terms in that perturbation can be neglected. And we've made this separation between some sort of basic flow and the perturbation. But last week we talked about instability and how these systems can grow. So now we're going to ask the question, what happens when they grow big enough that you can no longer consider that perturbation to be small? If it's big, if, if it's of the same order of magnitude as the gradients in the, in the background flow, or in the mean flow, if you like, um, how does it interact with the mean flow? So today we're going to talk about scale interactions in the atmosphere and ocean, and how um, these transient systems will modify the mean flow, or how they'll interact. So, talk about large scale forcing and transport due to transient systems. So, when I say forcing and transport, well, it's the same thing really. That these these uh, perturbations will transport properties. Okay, so they will be involved in fluxes of heat and momentum and potential vorticity, and that can be considered as a way of forcing the lower frequency flow. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So one of the important things to talk about there is closure and diffusion. So if you can't represent every single little transient system, is there some systematic way of representing their aggregate effect, the statistical effect on the average flow? Can that effect be represented in terms of lower frequency uh, variations or, or average flow. Okay, so that's closure and one simple approach to closure is to consider these transient systems as a form of diffusion. So you have gradients in the mean flow and you think of these transients as somehow diffusing or eroding, eliminating these gradients. So they work just the way ordinary diffusion would. Okay. In that way, they can modify the large scale potential vorticity. And we'll look at some examples of that, how it changes the ocean circulation. We'll look also at some atmospheric examples of how that might influence the low frequency variability in the atmosphere. And then we'll look at the atmospheric response to other types of forcing anomalies. So the atmosphere will respond to, for example, um, a change in the sea surface temperature. And that response might then be modified by the response of the transients as well. Okay, so you have the basic response and then you have the transients which will modify that response. And then finally we get on to more, some more um, turbulent stuff to do with uh, how flows on rotating planets tend to organize themselves into zonal jets. That's the, the last thing we'll talk about today. So let's have a look at this uh, video. <coughs> And this is the relative vorticity in the atmosphere at 250 millibars uh, from era interim wintertime data. And well, it looks very turbulent, doesn't it? I mean, it, it looks like uh, eddies in a uh, propagating basically eastwards in the extra tropics. But if you look, if you kind of stare at it for long enough, you can start to pick out some features and you can sort of convince yourselves that it's more active over the oceans than over the land. And these two ocean basins in the Northern Hemisphere, the Pacific here and the Atlantic, are the storm track regions. Okay. And then if you look, let's look at the Pacific here. And, and you see that there's a, in the Western Pacific, in the kind of upstream part of the Pacific jet, you see things are stretched out sort of in the zonal direction. But then as you get towards the eastern end of that uh, ocean basin, you'll see things getting stretched out more in the meridional direction, and that's pretty systematic. So there are consequences of that for how those transient systems interact with the jets which they are traveling on. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Okay, here's another example. This is in the ocean. So this is a, a model simulation of flow in the Labrador Sea, so here's Greenland, here's Labrador, Canada, and this, is, this shows a very strong annual cycle. So you see um, the arrival of the 
winter and you'll see uh, um, the cold winds coming off Labrador will cause this uh, sudden cooling in the, uh, the surface and that cooling which you see in blue is, is, is uh, mixed in the vertical very rapidly because it's convectively unstable and so that cools the whole column right down to the bottom of the ocean and then the question is after the winter how does that stratified state where it's warmer at the top than at the bottom how is that re-established and that's re-established by the transfer by these turbulent eddies you see these these are geostrophic eddies and you can see the coastal current around by Greenland and Rab Labrador I wouldn't call it warm but it's relatively warm compared to the uh, the cold water in the middle of the basin and the gradients between the coast and the center of the basin spawn eddies which then transfer heat into the basin and gradually re-establish that stratified state for the fo following summer okay so there's an example of heat transfer by transients influencing the mean state so let's try to uh, formalize that and so let's just consider this generic nonlinear system so here's a an equation for the advection and forcing of some tracer so let's say it's potential vorticity okay so q is our potential vorticity dq by dt plus the advection term that would be a conservation law but we have sources and sinks so we say there's a forcing and a dissipation some forcing you know, could be the wind stress or whatever and some dissipative sink which could be diffusion and that can also be written like this. It could be written, the advection term can be written as a Jacobian of psi and q, j psi and q, which is a convenient shorthand. Um, it just means the same thing. It's the advection of, of q by the, this non divergent flow associated with the stream function psi. Now let's just split up this flow, uh, of which the potential vorticity is a diagnostic. So we can split up psi and q into components associated with the average flow which is the bar terms psi bar and q bar here and the perturbation flow which is everything which is varying in time which is the primes q prime psi prime and so that nonlinear, that quadratic advection term will split up into four terms right you'll have the mean flow advection so that's the mean potential vorticity being transported by the mean flow then you'll have these terms where there's perturbation PV being transported by mean flow and there's perturbation flow transporting the mean PV. These are the kind of terms we've been looking at up to now with the, these are the linear terms, right? Linear in the perturbation. So these give us waves and instability. And then there's this term, which is psi prime Q prime, which is the term we've always neglected up to now, because if it's quadratic in the perturbation and the perturbation is small, then it's going to be negligible. But now, Let's think about the perturbation not being small, in which case we have to start thinking about what this term does. And one thing you can do is, if you're interested in the systematic effect of this term, well, it's got a non-zero time mean, you see. So if you take the time mean of this whole equation, well, the time mean of these two terms will be zero, okay? Because the time mean of, of the perturbation is zero by construction. But the time mean of the product of these two perturbations will not necessarily be zero. And so if we take the time mean of this whole equation, then the, the time mean of the advection, the advection of the mean tracer by the mean flow, will be balanced by three things. It will be balanced by the mean of the forcing, the, meaning of the, the mean of the dissipation, and the mean of this transient forcing term. So now we've put this term on the other side, on the right-hand side, and we are considering it as some sort of forcing, the forcing by the transient fluxes, okay? And that, I already discussed that, I think, in the first lecture uh, in terms of temperature, but it's a generally, quite often, people discuss it in, in that way, okay? So there's, there's a sort of formalism we're going, to, we're going to use in this lecture. And just in passing, we'll note that um, for the special case of time-independent unforced flow, so there's no time variation and there's no forcing or dissipation, then you note that if j psi and q is equal to zero, so the, the advection equals zero, this is a time-independent conservation law, then q is strictly a function of psi. Okay? So that means that contours of q will overlay contours of psi, and you'll have uh, basically no advection.
So that's a state which we're going to come back to. And now, so here's a, here's a nice picture of some turbulence. And you might think of these, the closed contours associated with this J psi Q equals zero as applying to any one of these little turbulent eddies. Or you might think of it as applying to something much bigger, like an, an ocean gyre. Okay? So we'll come back to that. So let's think about zonal uh, jets and momentum transport in zonal jets. So what I'm going to do is let's put an eddy in a zonal jet. So here's a typical eddy, right? That's my model of an eddy. It's just a, a closed contour of some sort. And we're going to advect it with a sheared zonal jet, so a jet with a maximum at the center. Okay? So what will the effect of that jet be on the shape of this eddy? It'll shear it out, so it'll gradually change its shape as it goes downstream. And you can see that my choice of colors here comes to the, the fresh fruit analogy. There's not much that can't be explained in terms of fresh fruit. So you're basically turning an orange into a banana. Right? And the fact that it ends up looking like a banana is important for the general circulation. Because if you think, of, again, of this jet varying following this equation here, which is du by dt, and then the zonal advection, the meridional advection, and then there's, I've bundled the force, the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force into one term here uh, using the geostrophic wind, and then there's some dissipation. Now, if you take, again, the time average of that equation, then the dissipation will be balanced by these advection terms. Well, these are fluxes of momentum. These are meridional fluxes of momentum, of zonal momentum. And uh, so we can characterize what they might be, those fluxes, by looking at the flow as it goes around one of these banana-shaped eddies. So if you look at the northern half of this eddy, then this arrow here is pointing northwest. So the perturbation uh, zonal flow is negative, the perturbation meridional really flow is positive, the covariance between u and v is negative, right? And likewise, on the way back, the covariance u, u prime positive, v prime negative, so the covariance is negative. Whereas if you look in the southern half of the eddy, here we have northeastward flow, so the covariance is positive. And then on the way back again here, negative and negative, so the covariance is positive. So we have basically southward flux of eastward momentum in the north and northward flux of eastward momentum in the south. So that's a convergence of momentum flux which will accelerate the jet towards the east and help to maintain that jet against this dissipation term on the right-hand side. Okay, so that is how the jet is maintained by mature finite amplitude synoptic systems. Okay, so there's a, an example of transient eddy feedback maintaining the mean flow.